eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is mine. Thank you, Mrs. Galvin, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to all of you here at St. James Church in Merrimack. How very kind of you to extend such a hearty New Hampshire welcome to this travel-weary troubadour and native prodigal son. It's always good to be back home in the old Granite State, especially in this year of 1876, as we celebrate the American Centennial. It's hard to believe it's been a hundred years since the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the spirit of 76 when my grandfather, Elisha Hutchinson, and his generation, our founding fathers, fought for freedom and established the national ideals of liberty and equality for all. Yes, my name's John Wallace Hutchinson, and I should like to tell you about the Hutchinson family singers. How we rose from humble origins in the New Hampshire hills to achieve national and international preeminence thanks to the God-given gifts of music and sweet family harmony. How the words of our songs and our very beings have ever served the cause of liberty, advancing freedom from enslavement, rights for women, and blessed temperance throughout these United States. Now, the Hutchinson family singers were first and foremost a quartet, consisting of my esteemed brothers, Judson and Asa, our dear sister, Abby, and yours truly, though it should be noted that various configurations and more than one generation of family members have indeed performed under the Hutchinson name over the years. Those of us in the original quartet would ultimately sing for American presidents and the crowned heads of Europe for thousands upon thousands of enthusiastic concert goers in the finest music halls and opera houses throughout the land and across the sea. <laughs> but we began our glorious musical journey modestly enough, traveling throughout northern New England in a sturdy, horse-drawn carry-all wagon, barely scraping by, giving concerts in towns and cities such as Wilton, Milford, Nashua, Manchester, Concord and Portsmouth, Lynn and Lowell, Massachusetts, Albany, New York, Portland, Maine, the fair city of Boston, and just about every crossroads in between. Now in 1843, our older brother Jesse, who sometimes took the stage with us, sometimes served as our business manager, and was ever our chief songwriter, wrote the words for what became our signature family piece, the old granite state. Now the melody comes from a favorite revival hymn, the old churchyard, and it never fails taking me back to those bygone days of yore, the long wagon rides, bumping along the back roads, just singing our way from one little town to the next. Let us now remember those days gone by as we raise true New Hampshire voices on the old granite state. Now the songsters have gone out into the pews, so you've got the words, all are invited and encouraged to sing along. What we lack in polish will make up for in strength. <laughs> we 
have come from the mountains we have come from the mountains we have come from the mountains of the old granite state good old-fashioned singers good old-fashioned singers good old-fashioned singers from the old granite state Liberty is our motto, liberty is our motto, equal liberty is our motto in the old granite state. Yes, we're friends of emancipation and we'll sing the proclamation till it echoes through the nation from the old granite state. We despise oppression, we despise oppression, we despise oppression and we cannot be enslaved. Enslaved. Liberty is our motto, liberty is our motto, equal liberty is our motto in the old granite state. How we love the rocks and mountains, how we love the rocks and mountains, how we love the rocks and mountains of the old granite state. Pointing up to heaven, pointing up to heaven, pointing up to heaven from the old granite state. Huzzah, 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 and huzzah for the old granite state. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and may I say that your voices are in fine form this evening. Perhaps some of you graduated from Brother Joshua's singing school in Milford those many long years ago. Well, our beloved parents, Jesse Sr. and Mary Hutchinson, raised a large happy brood on the family farm. I was born January 4th, 1820, in Mott Vernon, New Hampshire, the 11th of 13 children. When I was three years old, the family migrated from the upper altitudes of Mott Vernon, several miles down the valley, onto a larger property along the Sahegan River in Milford. Now, of course, there was always plenty of work to be done on the farm, and so we Hutchinson children grew up singing as we went about our chores. We sang while milking the cows, planting the corn, pulling the weeds, cutting the hay, gathering the hops, picking the apples, husking the corn, and chopping the firewood. When we were mere lads, we three youngest boys, Judson, Asa, and I, got together what resources we could for the purchase of stringed instruments, two violins and a cello, which we taught ourselves to play, gathered round a large granite boulder a fair distance from the house. We feared our Yankee father might not approve this expenditure of our time and energies. Now, the family did have musical roots. Our mother, as a young lady in Mont Vernon, sang in the meeting house choir with her sister Sarah. People said the two girls sounded like angels from on high. Our father, as a young farmer in Milford, played fiddle himself. But sensing a less than divine influence, he decided one day that music would lead only to idleness. And so he cut the instrument into pieces and fashioned a tobacco box from the bits. Well, with this bit of family history in mind, we tried keeping our rehearsals on the sly. But word got out, as it invariably does. Fortunately, we were able to obtain paternal consent, provided that we attended to our farm labors prior to following our musical pursuits, and this became strict family policy. Now eventually, for Thanksgiving of 1839, the Hutchinson family gave its first ever public appearance. All 15 of us sang together at the Baptist Meeting House in Milford. And the little concert was such a tremendous local success 
that afterwards, we three boys, Judson, now 22, Asa, a mere 16, and I, a ripe old 19 years of age, decided to give up farming in order to pursue a career in musical entertainment. Well, this time our father was somewhat less indulgent, and he advised us in no uncertain terms to leave home, earn a living, and make our own way into the world. And so, we went to Lynn, Massachusetts, for it was there that our brother Jesse had gone from the newspaper into the hardware business, and he helped us find lodging and secure gainful employment whilst we set up shop as musicians. Now, Jesse also introduced us to a brilliant young man who was to become a dear personal friend. His name was Fred, and Fred had recently escaped the horrors of enslavement near the southern city of Baltimore, fleeing north to seek freedom in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where technically he remained a fugitive from the long arm of federal law. Somehow, Fred was drawn to our music as we were drawn to his cause. Of course, we opposed the hideous and barbaric institution of American slavery. To think that a human being, a man, woman, or child, here in the United States of America, could be bought and sold like so much property forcibly separated from family and loved ones, deprived of all natural and good human comforts and freedoms, and made to labor and suffer the whip like a beast of burden. And all this wicked oppression based upon the color of one's skin, sanctioned by the supreme law of the land, the U.S. Constitution, why, surely this was the very antithesis of our American ideals and an abomination before the sight of a Christian God. Judson, Asa, and I all attended anti-slavery meetings in earnest. But during this period, it never occurred to us to give voice to the cause of emancipation by offering vocal performances at such gatherings, which tended to be rather serious, high-minded, and frequently contentious affairs, not without a considerable volume of hot air. And so, rather, we began to sing at temperance rallies, which had some of the spirit of the revival meetings of our youth. For like many good Christian men, and in spite of the loathsome cultivation of hops for beer, and apples for cider on our family farm in Milford, we younger Hutchinsons had joined the Washington Temperance Society and taken the Temperance Pledge, committing ourselves to lives free from the oppression of drunkenness and the tyranny of King Alcohol. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, I beseech all of you to do the same. King alcohol has made brandy of logwood hue, and hock and port and flip combined to make a man get blue. He says, be merry, for here's good sherry, and Tom and Jerry, champagne and perry, and spirits of every hue. Oh, are not these a fiendish crew, as ever a mortal knew? Oh, are not these a fiendish crew, as ever a mortal knew? King Alcohol has had his day, his kingdom's crumbling fast. His votaries are heard to say, our tumbling days have passed. For there's no rum, nor gin, nor beer, nor wine, nor brandy of any hue. No hot, nor port, nor flip combined to make a man get blue. And now they're merry without their sherry, or Tom and Jerry, champagne and perry, or spirits of any hue. For now they are a temperate crew, as ever a mortal knew. Oh, now they are a temperate crew, as ever a mortal knew. The shout of Washingtonians is heard on every gale. They're chanting out a victory over cider, beer, and ale. For there's no rum, nor gin, nor beer, nor wine, nor brandy of any hue. No hot, nor port, nor flip combined to make a man get blue. 
And now they're merry without their sherry, or Tom and Jerry, champagne and perry, or spirits of any hue. For now they are a temperate crew, as ever a mortal knew. Oh, now they are a temperate crew, and have given the devil his due. And may nothing stronger than cool, clear water cl quench every thirst. Ah. In 1840 and 1841, Judson, Asa, and I were calling ourselves the Aeolian Vocalists, and we took our show on the road, where we encountered all the inevitable ups and downs, along with many a bump along the way. Now, we sang together well and achieved a measure of artistic and critical success, even winning invitations to join Boston's prestigious Handel and Haydn Society. But we suffered from chronic financial distress. By the time we paid our room and board, rental for a suitable concert hall, upkeep on musical instruments, costumes, and horses, not to mention posters, programs, and sheet music, we were lucky to have a few pennies left at the end of the day, and many a night we sang for our supper. It was not a profitable enterprise. But then two things turned our fortunes around. First, our dear sister, Abby, began performing with us. Abby's crystal clear alto voice and beguiling, unaffected stage presence were the perfect complement to our manly harmonies. And this was all the more impressive given the fact that little Abby was just 12 years old when she officially joined the group. Now, of course, it caused our poor mother no end of worry to see her youngest child leave home at such a tender age, but we promised to take good care of our sister and return her home on a regular basis, which we always did. In fact, people said that we were a nest of brothers with a sister in it. And so, with us, her brothers, as chaperones, Abby Hutchinson was one of the very first young ladies in the nation able to embark upon a successful and respectable career in the field of entertainment. Now second, at the urging of a friend in Concord, New Hampshire, Nathaniel P. Rogers, president of the New Hampshire Anti-Slavery Society and publisher of an abolitionist newspaper, the Herald of Freedom, we began to accompany our brother Jesse and our friend Fred to anti-slavery meetings, first in Milford, then at Faneuil Hall in Boston. At the meetings, we sang rousing songs of freedom, and it soon became evident that our humble music, that gift from above, had the power to touch the hearts and stir the souls of men to noble ends with at least as much impact as speeches by the great leaders of the movement. Gifted orators such as William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and our friend Fred, whom history and all of you will know as the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass. It was our association with the cause of emancipation that propelled us onto the national stage, earning us considerable fame and not a little notoriety as well. Give me a ballad making for the revolution, Rogers wrote, and you may have all the law making. In 1844, Brother Jesse wrote the words for a Liberty Party campaign song that went rolling across the northern United States like that wondrous new marvel, the steam locomotive train. So let us climb aboard Freedom's car as we sing Jesse's Get Off the Track. 
Oh, the car emancipation rides majestic through our nation, bearing on its train the story, liberty, a nation's glory. Roll it along, roll it along, roll it along through the nation, freedom's car emancipation. All true friends of emancipation, haste to freedom's railway station, quick into the cars, get seated, all is ready and completed. Put on the steam, put on the steam, put on the steam, all are crying and the liberty flags are flying. Now again the bell is tolling, soon you'll see the car wheels rolling, hinder not their destination, chartered for emancipation. Wood up the fire, wood up the fire, Wood up the fire, keep it flashing while the train goes onward dashing. Hear the mighty car wheels humming, now look out the engines coming. Church and statesmen hear the thunder, clear the track or you'll fall under. Get off the track, get off the track, get off the track. All are singing while the liberty bell is ringing. See the people run to meet us, at the depots thousands greet us, all take seats with exaltation in the car, emancipation. Huzzah, 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 emancipation, soon we'll bless our happy nation. Huzzah, 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 emancipation, soon we'll bless our happy nation. And here's to emancipation. <sighs> Thank you. So the years of 1843 to 1849 were the heydays for the Hutchinson family singers. We met with bright lights, cheering crowds, and wild applause virtually wherever we went and we took the nation by storm, traveling by train and stagecoach, giving concerts and singing at anti-slavery meetings on a series of whirlwind tours crisscrossing the northern United States. In New York City, we sang at Concert Hall for the 10th anniversary of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Garrison promoted our appearances in his publication, The Liberator, and we were the hit of the convention, drawing maximum capacity crowds, all in the name of emancipation. In Washington, D.C., we sang at the White House for President Tyler, his family, and many distinguished guests, bringing our message of freedom to the very heart of the nation's capital. Now at the reception afterwards, Daniel Webster himself came to say hello. We were impressed by the great man, but rather disappointed to see him go through several glasses of wine over the course of the evening. <laughs> Another Granite State friend, Sarah Josepha Hale, featured us in her popular magazine, Godie's Ladies Book, telling our story to the world and getting our name into respectable parlors all across the nation. Our friend P.T. Barnum proclaimed, to endorse the Hutchinsons as the best of entertainers and philanthropists is as superfluous as a certificate to the sun for its warmth and brightness. <laughs> they were radiant days indeed, and even as our fame blazed in all its glory, we remained steadfast in our principles. On one occasion, dining in a fancy Boston restaurant, my friend Fred Douglas was denied service, so I went to the kitchen myself and found a meal for his plate. In Philadelphia, we chose to cancel a lucrative engagement in a fine hall, which after a bit of controversy in the press, decided it could no longer honor our policy of welcoming integrated audiences to all concert appearances. The Philadelphia Daily Sun published the following opinion. 
we have a serious charge to make against the managers of the Hutchinson family singers for not having announced in their handbills and advertisements that no distinction of color would be made in admitting persons to their concerts. It is well known that a distinction is made on all ordinary occasions and that there are many persons in the community who would on no account knowingly place themselves and their families in promiscuous association with the colored race. So much for the city of brotherly love. When uh, Hutchinson's come to town, all are welcome. Now during this period, the Hutchinson family singers might bring in several thousands of dollars by giving a few concerts in a major American city such as New York or Boston. This was as much income as our father, a reasonably well-to-do farmer in Milford, might produce in an entire year on the farm. And so we shared our newfound wealth with the good folks at home, with the profits from ticket sales and sheet music royalties. We built several fine cottages on a property owned by Brother Jesse in Lynn, Massachusetts. It was known as Old High Rock, and it became a second home to our large and ever-growing extended family. Now in 1843, I married my good wife, Fanny. In 1844, Fanny gave birth to our first son, Henry. In 1845, I had to bid them a temporary farewell when the Hutchinson family singers, along with our friend Fred Douglas, took a steam and sailing ship across the Atlantic to England, where in London, we performed for members of the royal family and charmed British aristocracy with our pure vocal harmonies and simple Yankee ways. The writer Charles Dickens was such an enthusiastic admirer, he invited us to dine with him and his family in their London home. Now Dickens was a most gracious host and is certainly a very talented writer. I shouldn't be surprised if his work is remembered in another 10 or 20 years, perhaps even to the end of the century. But once again, we were disappointed to see that a great man of letters might suffer a weakness for the fruit of the vine. But it was a highly successful tour of Great Britain, and in the summer of 1846, we made a triumphant return to our native shore. In 1847, my wife Fanny gave birth to our daughter, Viola, instantly and ever since the apple of her father's eye. Now meanwhile, Judson Asa, Abby and I continued touring together as the Hutchinson family singers. It was the zenith of our musical career and an exciting time for the nation as well. It was an age of progress marked by technological innovation, westward expansion, and ideological fervor. Some of the spirit of the age is captured in our song from 1847, Uncle Sam's Farm. For now, we had truly seen the world, and we knew without a doubt that our America was the greatest land in all God's creation. Of all the mighty nations in the east or in the west, oh, this glorious Yankee nation is the greatest and the best. We have room for all creation and our banner is unfurled. Here's a general invitation to the people of the world. Then come along, come along, 
make no delay. Come from every nation, come from every way. Our lands, they are broad enough, don't be alarmed. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. <laughs> the St. Lawrence marks our northern line as far as our waters flow, and the Rio Grande is southern bound way down to Mexico, from the great Atlantic Ocean where the sun begins to dawn, deep across the Rocky Mountains all the way to Oregon. And come along, come along, make no delay, come from every nation, come from every way. Our lands, they are broad enough, don't be alarmed. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. While the South shall raise the cotton and the West the corn and pork, New England manufactory shall do the finer work for those deep and flowing waterfalls that course along our hills are just the thing for washing sheep and driving cotton mills. Then come along, come along, make no delay. Come from every nation, come from every way. Our lands, they are broad enough, don't be alarmed. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. Yes, our fathers gave us liberty, but little did they dream. The grand results that pour along this mighty age of steam. Our mountains, lakes, and rivers are all ablaze of fire. And we send the news by lightning on the telegraphic wire. Then come along, come along, make no delay. Come from every nation, come from every way. Our lands, they are broad enough, don't be alarmed. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. Yes, we're bound to lead the nations, for our mottos go ahead, and we'll show the foreign paupers that our people are well fed. The nations must remember Uncle Sam is not a fool, for the people do the voting and the children go to school. Then come along, come along, make no delay, come from every nation, come from every way. Our lands, they are broad enough, don't be alarmed. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. Thank you. Yes, and here's to our Uncle Sam and this land of seemingly infinite bounty. In 1849, Cupid's arrow struck at the heart of the Hutchinson family singers. And nothing was ever quite the same after that. Our fair sister, Abby, now a very eligible 19 years old, fell in love and married a wealthy banker from New York City by the name of Ludlow Patton. Now Patton was a good man, and he still is, who loved our sister and appreciated the family's musical work. But Mr. Patton was old-fashioned in his thinking. He didn't think it proper for his young wife, now a married lady, to continue appearing in public as an entertainer. And so, alas, Abby basically retired from the group, except for special occasions. Our sister went on to a life of luxury and leisure while Judson, Asa, and I made the most of somewhat diminished circumstances. We remained together for a while, but as time went on, we grew more and more apart. Eventually, Asa would travel mostly in the West with various family members as the Hutchinson family singers, Tribe of Asa while I stayed mostly in the East with various other family members as the tribe of John. Brother Judson had a tribe of his own, but he drifted, much aggrieved by the inevitable family squabbling that arose. Our big brother Jesse abandoned the lot of us 
to undertake the management of a rival singing group, the Alleghenians. Sadly, Jesse perished in 1853, the victim of yellow fever, contracted in Panama on a return trip from California where he'd been promoting this other musical group. Now in 1855, Judson, Asa, and I reunited to go west. We traveled by train, canal boat, and covered wagon, initially with the idea of joining anti-slavery forces in Kansas. But Providence guided us instead to the Minnesota frontier, where we fulfilled a dream and established a new kind of American settlement, one based on peace, liberty, and equality for all, man and woman, black and white, living, working, and voting together. We named it Hutchinson, Minnesota, and I am proud to say that it is thriving still, despite being burned and nearly destroyed early on by a hostile band of Sioux Indians who failed to comprehend our noble intentions. They were eventually vanquished. And for many years, we Hutchinsons have divided our time between the New England states in the East and the New American territories in the West. Meanwhile, on a cold January morning in 1859, tragedy struck. I discovered the body of our beloved brother Judson deceased in one of the cottages at Old High Rock. Now, poor Judson had always been the most sensitive and perhaps best loved member of the family, and so his death came as a terrible blow, made worse because many newspapers at the time reported the unfortunate circumstances of his demise. It wasn't easy, but the family carried on. Now, the following year, Asa and I published over 50 songs for the Lincoln presidential campaign of 1860. Of course, we recognized that Lincoln was a great hope for the cause of emancipation. Now, Mr. Lincoln had actually attended a performance by the Hutchinsons in Springfield, Illinois during the 1850s. And when selected, President Lincoln hosted the Tribe of John for a performance at the White House. I remember the occasion well. We were ever so excited to sing for an American president we admired so very much. But we had a late start that night because of difficulties locating the key to the White House piano. <laughs> At one point in the program, daughter Viola was disconcerted to see that the president careworn and weary at the late hour, had fallen asleep during our performance. So I had to assure the dear girl that President Lincoln was merely resting his eyes in order to better appreciate the sound of her voice. <laughs> now Lincoln's favorite song from our repertoire was A Ship on Fire, but everyone's favorite Lincoln campaign song was Lincoln and Liberty, one of the many songs we published and performed countless times during that first campaign season. As we sing together Lincoln and Liberty, let us remember the unlikely gentleman from Illinois who became one of this nation's greatest leaders at its most difficult time and who would ultimately make the supreme sacrifice for his efforts to abolish American slavery while preserving the Union. Hurrah for the choice of a nation, our chieftain so brave and so true. We'll go for the great reformation, for Lincoln and liberty too. We'll go for the son of Kentucky, the hero of Hoosierdom through. The pride of the suckers so lucky, for Lincoln and liberty too. They'll find what by felling and mauling our rail maker statesmen can do. For the people are everywhere calling for Lincoln and liberty too. 
Then up with our banner so glorious, the star-spangled red, white, and blue. We'll fight till our banner's victorious for Lincoln and Liberty too. Our David's good sling is unerring, the slaver-crats giant he slew. Then shout for freedom preferring, for Lincoln and Liberty too. For Lincoln and Liberty too, for Lincoln and Liberty too. Hurrah for the choice of a nation, for Lincoln and Liberty too. Vote Abe Lincoln, 1860. Thank you. <laughs> well, of course, we were tremendously pleased when President Lincoln finally signed and authorized the Emancipation Proclamation, which went into effect January 1st, 1863, abolishing slavery in the Southern Confederate States. But the war years were a terrible time for the nation, as all of us gathered here to tonight remember only too well, the darkest chapter in our hundred year history. Antietam, Bull Run, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Shiloh. So many bloody battles, so many thousands of lives lost, so many families torn asunder. Now the war did bring about a reunion of sorts for the Hutchinsons as Sister Abby, motivated by patriotic spirit, came out of retirement for a series of performances with Asa and me, which were quite well received. We hoped that our music, good old-fashioned songs by good old-fashioned singers, and we were getting a little more old-fashioned each and every day, <laughs> might help comfort and inspire a nation at war. Now, from the beginning, the Hutchinsons sang the call to arms in support of the Union cause. In January 1862, the tribe of John created quite a stir while engaged to entertain troops camped at Fairfax, Virginia. We went in singing fiery abolitionist verse and nearly caused a riot amongst the ranks some of whom were not particularly enthusiastic about the prospect of war. As a result, our pass into the camp was revoked by General McClellan. But within a few short days, it was reinstated by order of President Lincoln himself, who was supposed to have said that our music was just the sort of thing the men needed to hear. Yes, we'll rally round the flag, boys, rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. We will rally from the hillsides, we'll gather from the plain, shouting the battle cry of freedom. The Union forever, hurrah, boys, hurrah, down with the traitors and up with the stars, while we rally round the flag, boys, rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. Yes, we sang the battle cry of freedom by George Root. It was on everyone's lips during those times. And it was our friend, Julia Ward Howe, who put new words to the abolition song, John Brown's Body, to create the battle hymn of the Republic. Naturally, we sang both lyrics. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. His soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His soul is marching on. 
Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In 1864, we helped publish and popularize a song written by our friend from right here in Merrimack, New Hampshire, Walter Kittredge, who was known as the minstrel of the Merrimack. Now, Kittredge had been drafted into the Union Army, and he wrote a song the night before reporting to Concord, New Hampshire for his physical examination. Walter was willing to do his duty and serve the Union, but he felt a sense of melancholy at the prospect of leaving his young wife and child at home. And so he put that into his song. Now as it turned out, Kittredge failed his physical because of an old bout with rheumatoid fever, and he never entered into military service. But that song he wrote tenting on the old campground, struck a chord on all sides, somehow putting into words the thoughts and feelings of so many of the American people who by this time were profoundly weary of the war. As we sing tenting tonight, let us remember the brave soldiers of the North and the South, the blue and the gray, not to mention the black and the white, and all the families who sacrificed so much in the struggle that nearly broke the Union once and for all. I, John Hutchinson, never spent a long night on a lonely battlefield, far from home amongst fallen comrades. But all of us who enjoy this nation's great freedoms will owe an eternal debt of gratitude to those who have served so nobly and so well. We're tenting tonight on the old campground. Give us a song to cheer. Our weary hearts, a song of home and friends we love so dear. Many are the hearts that are weary tonight, wishing for the war to cease. Many are the hearts looking for the right to see the dawn of peace. Tenting tonight, tenting tonight, tenting on the old campground. Tenting tonight, tenting tonight, tenting on the old campground. We're tired of war on the old campground, thinking of days gone by, of the loved ones at home who gave us the hand and the tear that said goodbye. Many are the hearts that are weary tonight, wishing for the war to cease. Many are the hearts looking for the right to see the dawn of peace. Tenting tonight, tenting tonight, 
Tenting on the old campground Tenting tonight, tenting tonight Tenting on the old campground We're tenting tonight on the old campground Many are dead and gone of the brave and true who left their homes others been wounded long many are the hearts that are weary tonight wishing for the war to cease many are the hearts looking for the right to see the dawn of peace Tenting tonight, tenting tonight, tenting on the old campground. Tenting tonight, tenting tonight, tenting on the old campground. Thank you. Well done. In the decade or so since the war, Asa, Abby, and I continue to lead busy, active lives, but our days traveling together as the Hutchinson family singers seem to have come to an end. Asa and I travel extensively with our separate singing families, while Abby, who never had children of her own, dedicates herself to her marriage with Mr. Patton, charitable and philanthropic works, and what might be described as a bountiful extended family. Now with the glorious achievement of emancipation and passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to the Constitution, guaranteeing free equal rights for all free men, we Hutchinsons have chosen to refocus our energies upon the cause of women's rights Imagine, a hundred years since the signing of the Declaration of Independence and still no vote for women? In 1867, the tribe of John spent two months campaigning for women's suffrage in Kansas with our friends Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. We may have lost that battle, but the war rages on. Now, quite recently, the Hutchinson family reconvened in the city of Philadelphia for the great American centennial celebration held there on the 4th of July. We went in support of our suffragist friends to advocate that the principle, all men are created equal, ought to apply to the ladies as well. We were invited on to the program of a special women's convention held on the 4th, and as ever, we prepared a special song for that occasion. I should like to conclude this evening's presentation by offering that song to you. One hundred years hence. Words by the suffragist Francis Dana Gage and music by the Hutchinsons. One hundred years hence, what a change will be made in politics, morals, religion, and trade, in statesmen who wrangle or ride on the fence. These things will be altered a hundred years hence, a hundred years hence. Our laws then will be non-compulsory rules, our prisons converted to national schools, the pleasure of sinning, tis all a pretense, and the people will see it a hundred years hence, a hundred years hence. 
Lying, cheating, and fraud will be laid on the shelf. Men will neither get drunk nor be bound up in self. To care for each other, tis just common sense. As Christian folk ought to a hundred years hence. A hundred years hence. Then woman, man's partner, man's equal shall stand, while beauty and harmony govern the land. To think for oneself, it will be no offense. The world will be thinking a hundred years hence, a hundred years hence. Oppression and war will be heard of no more, nor the blood of a slave leave its print on our shore. Conventions will then be a useless expense, for we'll all go free suffrage a hundred years hence, a hundred years hence. Instead of speech-making to satisfy wrong, all will join the glad chorus to sing freedom's song. The joy of one's partner will be recompense for sisters and brothers a hundred years hence, a hundred years hence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and may the songs of freedom play on for another hundred years, or as long as it takes for this great nation truly to achieve liberty and equality for all her people. And now let's finish in the New Hampshire style with a few verses of the old granite state and a resounding huzzah. We have come from the mountains, we have come from the mountains, we have come from the mountains of the old granite state. Good old fashioned singers, good old fashioned singers, good old fashioned singers from the old granite state. Liberty is our motto, liberty is our motto, equal liberty is our motto in the old granite state. How we love the rocks and mountains, how we love the rocks and mountains, how we love the rocks and mountains of the old granite state. Pointing up to heaven, pointing up to heaven, pointing up to heaven from the old granite state. Huzzah, huzzah, huzzah. Thank you very much. <laughs> ah. Eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah.